As you can probably guess, my name is Natalia Krawitz, and this is my colleague, Susan Mack. And it is Susan, basically, who is the one who has um, done a tremendous amount of work with pets. I am her student. I too have worked with pets, but not as intensively or as extensively as she has. And today what we would like to do is share some of the stories of the pets with whom we have worked and to talk to you a little bit about the healing system that we use, which is the system called Reiki. Closer? Okay. I'm sorry. All right, I'll cuddle this. Be very nice to it. I'll pretend it's a pet. <laughs> Give it Reiki. Okay. Okay, good. Now, I'm assuming that one of the reasons why some of you might be here is because you have pets. So I would just like to take a little poll and find out how many of you have cats? Ah, wise choice, the superior species. <laughs> how many of you have dogs? Ah, oh, equally wise choice, <laughs> even though I don't have one. Um, how many of you have other animals in your lives? Ah, okay. So this is very much a pet-oriented audience. Great. Uh, second of all, I'd like to know how many of you are familiar with Reiki? Great. How many of you have received a Reiki session? Okay, and how many of you might have are Reiki practitioners or have shared Reiki? Wonderful. Well, then that means I won't have to spend a great deal of time explaining what Reiki is or is about, and we can talk or focus much more on the pets. But for those of you who may not be aware of Reiki, um, or who may be using a slightly different system than the one that we use, Reiki is just a derivation of the ancient form of the laying on of hands. It's a very, very gentle system of healing, and it requires absolutely no manipulation of the body tissue. So unlike massage, where you are actually manipulating the tissue, with Reiki, you are simply laying on your hands. Now, Reiki can be delivered or shared in two forms, one of which is direct contact, where the palm or sole of your hand is resting directly on the recipient with whom you wish to share. The other version is done at distance, and that can be done at any distance from your hand just being slightly above the being who's receiving it, all the way to thousands of miles away. And either way, it appears to be equally effective. And often when working with pets, we're quite challenged because if you're going to work with an elephant, if you're going to work with a, a horse and you're Susan's size, you might have a little challenge in terms of covering the entire body. And that's one of the ways in which distance will really, really pay off and come in handy. The other is that when we're thousands of miles away from our pets, as we are right now, uh, Susan and I can spend the time keeping in contact with them through distance. Now the major reason for doing Reiki, at least Reiki with humans, is that it's a system of self-healing or self-treatment. And that really is the basis of the Reiki system. The idea is that you do self-treatment to keep yourself clear as a channel, because basically what you're doing is you're taking the energy in universal energy around you through your head and it's going out your body through the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And the idea is that if you have collected a lot of, um, shall we call it, uh, psychic detritus in your body from being angry, from not taking care of yourself, etc., that will interfere with your ability to clearly pass it through your body and share it with someone else. So as I said, the fundamental basis of it is self-healing. And uh, in Susan's case, that's how she originally got involved in it. In my case, it's slightly different, and I'll share that with you in a moment. But there are many benefits for sharing Reiki with, with someone or some being. Uh, one of the greatest ones is the alleviation of stress. It is a wonderful stress reduction and stress management system. It can also alleviate pain, both acute and chronic. It can slow the progress of cancer. We have many, many cases where that has done so phenomenally. It um, can help resolve emotional issues. And it's a wonderful way to help palliate and assist and support the process of dying. So those are the areas in which we have used or shared Reiki with pets. And those are some of the kinds of stories that we would like to share with you today. 
I'm just going to start off by telling you how I got involved and then hand it over to Susan for her to share some of her stories. Um, the first 20 years of my professional career were not spent in anything alternative whatsoever, but in something terribly conventional, psychology. Um, I have a doctorate in psychology and I spent it as a consultant in the public and private sectors uh, dealing with the social aspects of environmental issues. And then in 1990, I became owned by a cat. Now, for those of you who have cats, you know you do not own the cat, the cat owns you. Catherine Twinkletoes, Rusty Ginger Krauts McDonald, the name being much longer than the cat, came into my life quite unexpectedly and quite by surprise because I had been allergic to cats and I had not had a cat since I was four and a half years old. Now, I won't tell you my exact age, but I can assure you that in the 1990s, I was in my 40s. And there was just something about her that pulled her to me and me to her, and the next thing I knew, we were an item. We got along quite well for the first couple of years. I mean, she had great standards of etiquette. She had ideas of how I should behave, and me being very compliant and hopefully compassionate, did my best to adhere to her high standards. And then once when we were away, she became very mysteriously ill, and we almost lost her. And she kept having these mysterious bouts of incredible pain where she wouldn't eat and became anorexic. At one point, she had to be tube fed for six weeks. And the vet couldn't find anything wrong with her. So our veterinarian actually said, you know, I have a mind to tell you to contact, you know, one of those animal psychics in California. Little did she know I already had. Um, <clears throat> just do something because this cat is not amenable to conventional medical care. So the next thing the vet said is, you know, I actually think the problem's behavioral. So I thought, hmm, I have a doctorate in psychology. I can do this. I can do this. So like any good parent, except a parent of a per person rather than a parent of uh, a human being, I went and started to learn about alternative medicine. So I got certification in Reiki, in therapeutic touch, in flower essences therapy, and I went to Cornell University Veterinary Medical School summer programs to take courses in cat behavior. I launched a new career as a wellness educator and as a cat behaviorist. It turned out that Catherine's problem truly was medical. Uh, she had pancreatitis, which at that time was not thought to affect cats, and did. And it was at that time, through teaching a wellness course at the SPCA, that I met Susan. And uh, Susan intrigued me because while most people are often people-oriented and will at least come over to you and say hello, instead Susan bypassed me immediately and went for the um, Humane Society's mascot cat, Sassy, introduced herself, and the two of them were in Reiki heaven immediately. I thought, now this is the kind of person I need to work with my cat. And so she came over, and she worked with Catherine Twinkletoes. And she and Catherine had uh, many, a multi-year relationship. And one of the most interesting things about that relationship was that um, Catherine and she would wander about the place. I'd never seen Reiki sort of delivered in this way. I mean, I'm used to human Reiki, so I would be used to, you know, the massage table, the soft music, perhaps the fragrant oils, the candles. Instead, there's Catherine plopped on the living room, and the next thing I know, she's getting up and wandering. I would have thought, okay, that's the session over. Oh, no, 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 there's Susan following her, following her with her hands, and they're having a conversation. As Catherine's going to the food bowl for some munchies, she's going to the water bowl for some refreshment, and get this, then Catherine takes her on a tour of the house. But not any tour of the house. Catherine takes her to my closets to show her the dust bunny. <laughs> Catherine takes her to show the unmade bed. Obviously, Catherine had an evaluation of my housekeeping that she wishes to get a little message across anyway. So anyway, without further ado, that's how I got involved, slowly, slowly but surely, and became more and more involved with Susan and with Susan's work. But I'm going to hand it over now to Susan so that she can share some stories. She has promised to share some dog stories as well as some cat stories. And hopefully before the end of the session, I too will be able to get another two cents worth in about some of the cats that I have worked with. But without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Susan. Hi. <laughs> you just have to bear with me. I'm very shy and this is hard. 
So um, if I get stuck, Natalia will jump in. And okay, um, I got into this uh, because I have been receiving Reiki, and I took the course just as a so I could do self treatments. And um, the animals who I'd always had a connection with started coming up to me wherever I went, and um, they'd slide under my hands. And one day. I was deep in a very deep self-treatment. And um, this wave of blue came, and, and it was this wonderful business card that said Reiki for pets in the comfort of their home with a paw and a hand on it. And it was in full color and everything. And um, <clears throat> I came out of the self-treatment and realized that a long time had passed. That night I couldn't sleep because I kept seeing this business card. It followed me around all over the place. Now, <clears throat> I did not have a lot of money at that time. Um, I was working my way off welfare due to having crashed through burnout and everything. And um, so I couldn't get this thing out of my head. So I went down to a, a print shop and I drew this thing for them. And of course, wouldn't you know it, it was all special order paper, special order inks. <laughs> and that, so I said, I, I need this done. So they said, well, we'll do up 500 is the smallest order. And that, and a week later she called me and she said, here's a black and white proof. So if you want to save money, we can just do it up this way. And I said, no, can't do that. And um, so a week later, she called me and said, they're ready and it'll be $160. So that day I sold my TV and my VCR for $160. And went and got my cards and started setting them out at places. There was a flower essence place in Edmonton at that time called Self Heal. I put my cards there, some of the massage therapy clinics, um, Ascendant Books, which is a new age bookstore there. And, um, Flash of Insight, there were a few places. And um, I got, I started to get, um, it took time, but I started to get a few calls. And they were people who had been in these places and they didn't have sick pets or anything. Some of them didn't even have pets. But they couldn't get away from this card. They would end up having to go back to it and when they bought whatever or had finished browsing, they left with this card. And then they would either pass the card on to somebody else, or they would call me, and sometimes it was months later. They had no reason why they need this card, it just wouldn't let them leave. So I was glad that I had not gone for the black on white. And um, I went to meet with some of the veterinarians, going from clinic to clinic. Some of them were very polite, some of them told me in rather crude language to get off their property. <laughs> and um, one veterinarian called me one day and she, um, she said she wanted me to um, go meet with a dog. She was the only holistic veterinarian in the Edmonton area at that time. And she was familiar with Reiki and she had had me come back to her clinic um, and to meet with a cat there and I didn't realize she was testing me. And she had somebody in the room with me and I did Reiki with the cat. The cat didn't have anything wrong with her or anything. And what it was was the woman who was in the room could feel energy. And she told the vet afterwards that yes, she's actually doing Reiki. And um, so anyway, my first paying client, because I had been doing a lot of pro bonos just with friends and all that, see what would happen, uh, was Tess the Golden Retriever. She was a patient of this veterinarian. And this veterinarian had actually just met her. She had gone through five other veterinarians who couldn't figure out why she was limping with her, uh, I think it was the right left leg, right back leg, I mean. <laughs> and. Um, so when I met Tess, the people were exhausted. They couldn't sleep. They had sleeping bags and everything beside 
where Tess was in, in the porch area, which is her favorite area. Um, Tess was exhausted. She couldn't sleep because of the incredible pain that she was in. And I put my hands on Tess, the golden retriever, and started sharing Reiki with her. And all of a sudden, golden retrievers are pretty big. All of a sudden, she rolled me over, and she was lying on top of me. And so I just stayed that way for a while with my hands on her. And uh, then she eventually rolled off, and I continued on. And I was with her for a couple of hours. And, um, and the people booked me immediately because Tess's face had relaxed. And um, I went back the next day. And they were very excited because all, all three of them had managed to get several hours sleep after I left. So I continued doing these sessions with Tess. I didn't have a car or anything. These people were, were eager to pick me up and drive me there. And at that time, I only had level one Reiki. I couldn't do distance with Tess. I could only do hands-on with her. So I was there every day treating her and did this for about a week and a half, week, week and a half. It's been a lot of years now. And um, we were getting her ready for surgery because the, the vet had decided she did have to do exploratory surgery because there was just such a mystery as to this lameness and this pain. And um, what they discovered through all the lab work and everything was that during that period of Reiki, which also enabled Tess to sleep, she started getting um, regular sleep and everything because it was helping to manage her pain so much. And so her people gained, but her um, blood was getting stronger. And um, all her organs and everything were working better. And just all her systems were being supported. So when she actually went from the, for the surgery, she was less of a risk for going under anesthetic. They ended up having to amputate the leg. And so I went back to, um, to continue working with Tess, did a couple of sessions with her, and, and um, then I went back for the third one. I'll never forget this because she grabbed my arm and, and took me to the back door. She was very excited. She wanted to show me something. So it was very clear I used to go out in the backyard with her, so I did. And what it was was she wanted to show me she could pee without falling over. She had figured out her balance. So, and then she started bouncing around and showing me just that she could really maneuver and she wasn't falling over and, and she was just very excited. And of course, I was excited and her people were excited. So um, I worked with Tess for a little bit longer. And the other thing is, is her lab work after her surgery showed that her platelets were rebuilding at an incredible rate. And the veterinarian said that this wasn't possible for them to be rebuilding at that, that speed. She said even with her herbals and everything, this was something beyond um, what was possible. And with Reiki, you just don't know what's going to happen. So uh, Tess's people eventually took a Reiki course themselves so that they could continue treating her on a daily basis. And, um, and we kept in touch. And, and she lived another eight years. So. So like they said, through Reiki, they were given that gift of that time with her. And they had a wonderful eight years with her. So <clears throat> in my own life, my cat friend uh, showed us how powerful Reiki is with kidney disease. Friend never really liked Reiki at the start. I took the Reiki course. My cat Beaker's Siamese, he, he loved the Reiki. I would wake up at times feel my feet pulsing, and I'd look in there, he was helping himself. <laughs> you know? 
or I'd wake up and feel this weight on my chest and my hands pulsing and realize that he was lying on my chest and my hands were on him. And again, he was helping himself. It's, he loved Reiki. But friend would kind of indulge me. I'd go and I'd want to do some Reiki with her. It's like she was a little tabby, tabby cat. And actually her picture is out at the table there. And she, um, she let me put my hands on her, and, and she made it very clear that she was indulging me. And then after about 10 minutes, she'd say, okay, that's enough. I'm done, and off she'd go. And if I tried to pursue her, she'd punch me. So, <laughs> friend was a very dominant little tabby, kept us all organized. Anyway, <clears throat> she, um, at one point, she started demanding Reiki. And it wasn't for a few minutes. Started off 45 minutes, then an hour, and then we're getting up into two and three hour sessions. I, and she looked perfectly healthy. She was a little bit overweight, and she was showing absolutely no signs of illness. So I took her in to, to my veterinarian, who's um, um, now she does some Chinese medicine, but that time she was completely conventional. And um, she, um, she said, why are you here? And we had talked about the whole Reiki thing. And, and I said, because friend is demanding all this Reiki. And she looked down at friend and she said, friend is demanding Reiki. I said, yes. And she picked her up and she said, I'll be back in a few minutes. We're doing blood work. And off she took her for blood work. And she brought her back and examined her. And she says, well, she appears perfectly healthy through the standard exam. So we'll see what the blood work says. So the next day she phones me and she says, I don't know about that stuff you do, but your cat is in kidney failure. And she said, I would never have thought. So she said, we're going to check her blood every three months, monitor her, and check her urine for her specific gravity, because the specific gravity tells how well the kidneys are functioning because the urine gets concentrated better if they're functioning better. And um, we did that. And after a year, her, her values, everything was normal. And Dr. Lambrink said, this is impossible, but your cat's not in kidney failure anymore. Friend wasn't asking for Reiki. And um, while I'd been working with, with other cats and dogs with kidney disease, it hadn't clicked in my head yet about the connection between the kidneys and the Reiki. And of course, Reiki is a detoxifier, and that hadn't clicked in my head either. So a friend wasn't asking for Reiki, so we weren't doing our big sessions or anything. And if she came, then I did Reiki, and I wasn't chasing her down. And she'd sit beside me. At this point, I had my second level, so I was doing a lot of distance Reiki, and she'd sit beside me and hitchhike. But that was about it. Well, a month and a half later, here she is, perfectly healthy, and she starts vomiting nonstop. The night before, she'd been tearing around playing, chasing her tail. Her tail was her, her favorite toy. And um, in the morning, it was a Sunday, she started vomiting. I didn't have the money to take her in to emerge. And she kept running away from me, so I just, I was doing distance, and she was really taking it. And I could feel this incredible pain in my lower back area. And um, I ran her into the vet first thing in the morning when they opened. And Dr. Lambert said, she must have gotten into something. I said, no, nothing for her to get in. Oh, she must have. And she said, well, I have to do x-rays and everything. She phoned me later, and she says, she is ulcerated all the way down her esophagus and her abdomen, her intestines. She says, I've got her an IV. We're starting her on stomach coders and everything. She says, I've sent off the blood. She says, she had to have gotten into something. I went to visit friend. And the next day, I went to visit her. And Dr. Lambert says, I need to talk to you. And friend is really feisty. Dr. Lambert comes up to me, and friend raises her IV paw and starts shaking it at her and howling and giving her crap because she really resents this treatment. And. Um, Dr. Lambert says, can I talk to you? So I said, OK. And she says, you know, the lab thinks she's dead. She says, her kidney values are so high, she is absolutely toxic. 
She said, when you brought her in, we should have been able to smell the toxicity, the uremia in the back of the clinic. She says, but she smells quite nice. She says she should be skin and bones, unable to lay, raise her head. She is so toxic. And she said, have you been doing that stuff with her? I said, no. <laughs> and she said, Reiki has to do a form of energetic dialysis. So I called in favors. There were a lot of people who now had their Reiki, who I'd done a lot of extra work with their animals. Some of it had been pro bono when they ran out of money and things like that. And they had always said, if there's anything we can do for you, please call. And I said, my cat's in critical condition. Can you please start setting Reiki? And there were some Reiki masters who I knew. And um, I called them, and they said, of course, we'll help you out. So friends started getting, they set up shifts, and they were sending to her 24 hours a day. And I was sending to her. A week later, the vet checked her blood work. Her levels had dropped by a third. And she said, this is impossible. And I was, of course, visiting her every day. I'd do hands-on there, and, and then I would um, do distance from home. And she said, I'm going to release her because she's now able to hold the food down. She said, but she's unable to eat on her own, so you're going to have to force feed her. And she can only hold down a teaspoon at a time, so you're going to have to get up. You're going to have to feed her every hour and a half around the clock because she needs a minimum of 60 mils of food or she's going to go into fatty liver disease. So this is what I did, and the community kept sending to her, and friend turned around completely. And I had her for five more years before she went into another total collapse. And when we did, um, Dr. Lambrink was quite happy to autopsy her for me because we were both very curious. Because again, when she died, she did not look like a kidney cat. But what happened was she suddenly started vomiting and she swelled up to three times her size. She couldn't pee, her kidneys had shut down completely and we could not get them going again, no matter what. So she autopsied friend and then when I came to meet with her, she said, sit down. She says, this is very bizarre. She says, I'll probably never see this again in my entire career and I've never seen it before. She said, a kidney cat, of course, should be skin and bone. She says, friend had a very healthy layer of fat, internal layer of fat. She said, normally, when they've had kidney disease as severe as she had, all the organs should be affected. She says, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of stress starting to show on the heart, but otherwise, her organs are perfect. She said, but. There was almost nothing left of the kidneys. She said, I sent off kidney tissue to find out. And she says, at my own cost, she said, I sent it off to the lab to find out if she had a rare form of kidney disease. She said, she didn't. She had the regular kidney disease. She said, but obviously, she needed some functioning kidney tissue for the Reiki to be able to detoxify her. And... Um, and friend, I had worked with an animal communicator through the years with her, and friend had considered herself a Reiki master in her soul. <laughs> but, and I'm going to let Natalia tell you about Timmy, who is on the front cover of our book. Um, and, and after Timmy, I'll tell you another dog story. Well, I think you can tell that Susan has had a lot of very profound experiences with animals. What I want to do as I'm talking about Timmy, who is quite a character, is pass you out, uh, pass along some pictures of the pets that we've worked with. Now, I give apologies to all of those of you who have dogs, that we do not have a lot of dog photos. I just grabbed what I had, and they all turned out almost 99 and 44 and 100 percent of them to be cats. But one of them happens to be the notorious Timmy. So just have a look. 
Now, Timmy is quite a character. He's an orange cat. He is no longer with us in physical form. But um, he lived with his person and his litter mate and sister, Beauty. And Timmy was very much the man of the house, real macho male, controlled everything, and he had a tremendous sense of humor, real party guy. And Susan was called in to work with him, actually at distance, she'd never met him, uh, because he had been undergoing some treatment because he was not eating, there were all kinds of symptoms of illness, they uh, were having to tube feed him and do exploratory surgery. And the problem was that after this exploratory surgery and as he had his tube in, that he was no longer able to eat on his own and his gastrointestinal functions had shut down. So there was no evidence of any activity in the stomach, in the intestine, in the bowels. And this cannot go on on a continued basis without being life-threatening. So Susan had been called in, and I gather what your first session with him Within the first session with him, Susan and he get together, and the first thing they start hearing are stomach sounds, which is a wonderful signal that the GI system is now starting to come back in track. And within 24 hours of his first Reiki session, he uh, was starting to function normally and starting to process his food. First step on the road to recovery. Now, I'd love to be able to end the story there and say, okay, he's there, he's on the road to recovery, hallelujah. There was, however, a fly in the ointment, and that was that as a result of the exploratory surgery, they'd done a biopsy, and they had discovered lymphosarcoma. Lymphosarcoma is a form of cancer, and it is very typical at time of diagnosis in a cat that regardless of whether or not you treat it, your cat has between six and nine months to live. So this was Timmy's prognosis, and uh, Timmy's person was impressed enough with the Reiki that had occurred that she continued to retain Susan to work with Timmy as he was preparing for uh, this degenerative disease. Except that Timmy didn't quite degenerate the way that the veterinarians had expected. What would happen, though, is that Susan would visit him very regularly, and they would have their private and quite intense sessions. And um, from time to time, he would have bouts of considerable pain. So he would have these Reiki sessions, and then for several weeks or several months, he would be perfectly fine. He'd have high energy levels. He'd have a great appetite. He'd love to play. He loved to hide on Susan so that she would have to go and start yelling through, where is Timmy? Where is Timmy? And he'd jump up behind the curtain to frighten her. These were the kinds of things that he really enjoyed doing. And then, as I said, every so often, sometimes unexpectedly, Susan would sometimes say, you know, I think I, I'm hearing from Timmy. I'm, he I'm getting this pain. I, I know where it is, and that's Timmy. She would go to see him. He would have stopped eating. He would be lethargic. His coat wouldn't look good. And this would have happened quite suddenly. And during this time, she would know that she would have to work with him, sometimes two, three hours at a time, in order to help him work through his pain. So they had this little system where she would always schedule him for the last of her appointments because she would never know how long it would be. And um, he would start working with her and they would start sharing the Reiki. And because Susan is clairsentient, which means that she can feel an animal's pain in her body, um, it's not the animal's pain, but she can actually feel it, know sort of roughly where it is in the animal. She would be in this incredible pain as they were sharing the Reiki as well. And one of the things that really fascinated me was her descriptions of this kind of pain, because every single time the pain was different. So she said there was one time the pain was absolutely freezing, you know, that kind of freezing cold that is so cold it burns you. So there's Susan kind of hunched over in this burning, freezing pain working with Timmy. And Timmy sends her this telepathic image. And here's Timmy. And he's dressed up like, like a welder, and he's got a blowtorch. And he's taking blowtorch to that pain, which looks like ice, and he's shaving it down and melting it down. And she can feel the pain melting through her. So another time, and, and one of my most favorite images, uh, was the time when she had this vision of Timmy as they're working. And Timmy is dressed up in Wellington boots, Wellington Boots, hip waders, right, up to the hips. He has a yellow slicker raincoat on with the matching yellow slicker hat. 
And he's, do and he's got lab gloves, but the lab gloves go all the way up to his armpits. And the reason is, as he's working with his pain, the pain feels really slimy, and it's splattering all over him as he's dissolving it. So every time that she and Timmy had a session together, she wasn't quite sure what image Sim Timmy was going to send her and exactly what form that pain was going to take. But as Susan tells me, there were times that she was working with him that there would be tears streaming down her face because the pain would be poker hot or ice cold or jabby, and she would feel these sort of rough jabs coming out her side as she's working with Timmy. So you can see that there was kind of an extraordinary rapport. Now the interesting thing is that um, Timmy was going to make sure that he had a lasting impact on Susan. And from what we understand, Timmy was a very strong force in having us write the book, My Teachers Wear Fur Coats. So we were quite interested in what was going to happen with respect to the cover. And Susan and I had talked a lot about whether or not we should request that some of the animals that we've worked with actually appear on the cover. Uh, we didn't sort of forward that request to our publisher. Instead, we just sent some vague instruction. And they had similarly given some instruction to their graphic artist. Now, I want to show you what came up. What came up was what we least expected, which was a kind of a cartoon graphic in a retro style. Now, the fun thing about this is I wasn't quite sure. I, I was quite surprised by the cover. And I sent it off to Susan and asked her what she thought. And her first comment was, there's Timmy. He's got himself on the front of the cover. <laughs> and she took this cover over to Timmy's person. And it was the exact same reaction. Because this particular cat in this particular form is the cartoon image that Timmy used to send Susan telepathically. So I can proudly say that Timmy is definitely on the cover of this book, so he really wanted to see it happen. The other thing I can tell you is that although Timmy is no longer with us, Timmy did defy that veterinary prognosis. And I'll tell you by how much. As I, as I said before, the average prognosis for a cat diagnosed with lymphosarcoma is six to nine months. Timmy died five years after diagnosis. Quite a testament to Reiki. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Timmy had a wonderful quality of life. Those pain episodes would go on for about 48 hours. And, but with each, each treatment that he and I would do, they would ease off. And then they'd be gone. And, um, and then he'd be running around playing again, doing his jokes. He'd hide behind the, the window curtains and jump out at you. And, and uh, he had all, all sorts of things. He was a cat with very good humor. He loved practical jokes and everything. And, you know, and then the he then he'd start to have another downturn, and we'd do our work again, and he'd release all his pain energy. And away we go again. And that. So it wasn't like we were keeping a cat alive who was suffering. You know, he had a wonderful quality of life. And when, when he crashed, he crashed fast. And it was apparent to everybody that he wasn't coming back this time. An animal communicator talked to him, and he said, yes, please let me go. It's time now. Um, please do the euthanasia, which was something that had been talked to him before. He said, there's, um, there's no karmic payoff to suffering through it when you can be released. So Timmy also, in one of my treatments, gave me a wonderful gift about how um, Reiki helps with the time span with, with cancer. I was doing a distance with him one day, 
And I got this vision of an hourglass full of sand. And the sand was pouring down quite quickly. And this wave of blue came in and pushed the sand back up. It couldn't push all of it back up, but it pushed some of it back, a lot of it back up. And, and then the sands of time would start again. And this would come in, but eventually the hourglass did empty out. And I realized that he was explaining to me that what the Reiki does is, Reiki isn't linear in time or anything like that, is it just tr transforms that time and slows it down. And in essence, gives them more time. And I thought that was a wonderful piece of information that he gave me because it was something I'd been thinking about. So, now I'd like to talk to you. Um, do any of you have greyhounds? No. I have a greyhound friend, Y. She's 14 and a half now. And um, I've done a lot of Reiki with her over the years. I met her. I do some work with um, a breeder of American Cocker Spaniels. And um, why kind of watches over all the Cocker Spaniels and, and everything. And um, one day, um, why is also different from the other greyhounds I've met because she's never been on a racetrack or anything. She's been a pet from the time she was eight weeks old. And um, so, with why it was really interesting to meet a greyhound who didn't have any emotional issues at all. Um, she's um, completely self-confident and happy. She's never had any emotional trauma or that happened to her. Anyway, she um, one day she was going out the screen door and she didn't move fast enough and her tail got slammed in the door. So her person took her to the vet, and they had to amputate part of the tail. And they sent her home wrapped up in bandages and everything. And um, her person had me come out and do some Reiki and stuff, so I did that. Um, but she didn't think it was necessary for me to do any intense work or anything like that. So we didn't. Anyway, they they unwrapped the bandages when she went back for her recheck and dry gangrene had set him. Gangrene? Yeah. Dry, the dry form of it. And um, so they had to do, amputate more of the tail. And I was there that time and the um, veterinarian uh, who is also a greyhound breeder told us that Circulation in, in tails of any dog is bad, but with a greyhound, it's particularly bad. And when they get these kinds of injuries, they end up continuing to amputate until there's nothing left. And they said, so brace yourself for more surgeries. So we went home with Y, and her person said, I just want you to do your thing. So I worked very intensely with Y, and I she would lay there and let me um, hold her tail. And you could feel it would be ice cold down at the end. And I would just keep holding her tail until everything warmed up. And then I'd go and I'd do full body with her because it's very important that full body get treated as well. And then at night, I had um, a tiger, a toy tiger with a tail and I would sit and I'd send distance to her and I would hold the tail of this tiger. And again, I, it would start off really cold and it would warm up. And I, I would do this a couple times during the night. And we just did this on a daily basis. When Y went back for her recheck, her tail was healed up. It's the first time that they had never had to continue with amputations. So. <clears throat> And why? Um, because she runs under barbed wire and things has taught us a lot about how quickly injuries can heal with the assistance of Reiki. And that, and she's also quite a diva. If I arrive there and she's got a little scratch, she's collapsed on her couch and can't raise her head. She just raises her paw a little bit and looks at me with sad eyes. 
until I sit down and do some Reiki with her. And then she bounces up and says, I'm fixed. <laughs> so she's quite funny. And um, 14 and a half is very old for a greyhound, so I just appreciate every day that I have with her. But she's still out running every day in her, on her land and everything. Um, a Cocker Spaniel who used to live with Y, her name was Victoria. And uh, Victoria had a rectal tumor. And um, it was benign, but it was so wrapped around everything that it could not be removed. And she would have a lot of rectal bleeding. And I would do distance Reiki with her, which was very uncomfortable for me because that's not an area I like to feel sensations in. <laughs> And the Reiki would stop the bleeding. So every day I would go there and I'd do distance with her. But started taking longer and longer. So um, this is one of the reasons I went on for my mastery, so that I could work with a higher frequency of Reiki. And it was, it was um, very uh, dramatic, the change that happened. I continued doing these treatments with Victoria. And um, lo and behold, this sensation in my butt end went away. And so I, I was out there working with the dogs, and I, and I said to Marnie, I said, you know, I'm not getting that sensation anymore. Like, what's going on with Victoria? You know, Victoria's running around all over the place. She says, oh, didn't I tell you? She says, I took her into the vet, and um, the tumor had shrunk down to where they could remove it completely. It's not there anymore. <laughs> and I said, well, I would have appreciated that knowledge. Because <laughs> Victoria never told me, other than the sensation going away. She's just happy to have her sessions. <laughs> we unfortunately um, lost Victoria a couple years later because she was recovering from hemolytic anemia when a salmonella outbreak went through the kennel. And uh, she crashed before we realized she had caught it. So, and because she was on steroids, her system could not, didn't have a chance. So, but, um, yeah, talk about Simon. I've got one more story, then questions, if that's okay. You bet, you bet. Now for this one, I have to go up to the podium because this is a very emotional story for me. So I've written it out, otherwise I'm going to lose it. Okay. Um, it's a story about Simon, a, a cat who was very important in my life. Uh, when I first met him, he was 16 years old and looked like a Holstein cow. If some of you see the picture being passed around, you'll know that he has a black mask around his eyes and his little pointed ears kind of looks like Zorro, a little black nose. And his markings were so unusual and so symmetrical that I swear he could have won best cat in any cat show. Anyway, when I first met him, he'd been branded a troublemaker. He had been astray by the time he was 18 months old, had been taken in by someone who had a cat family of two, and didn't have the heart to have him adopted out. So that's when the trouble started, because her resident male took one look at Simon and declared war. So the battles took place in the home, using the weapons at hand, razor-sharp claws and urine, to do both bodily injury and, as importantly, to mark areas of territorial importance. Territory is really important to a cat. If the cat is calm and content, he'll mark the objects, including people, by rubbing his cheeks against you. Okay, let the anxiety escalate a little. We're going to start to scratch. Get it really ratcheted up, and we'll spray. And that's what these boys did. Fifteen years later, I get a call as a cat behaviorist to come and negotiate the peace. I looked at the house, it told me the story. The carpets on the, all of the stairs were completely shredded. The furniture was sprayed with urine. And some of the walls had been so soaked with urine that they had needed replacing. In fact, the man of the house was in the middle of replacing the drywall. The renovations were underway and the people were concerned that this problem was not going to be alleviated. 
So it was the renovations, not the cat problem, that had them call me in. I came to the conclusion that Simon needed to be rehomed, but the family would have nothing to do with this until they noticed fresh urine marks on the fresh drywall. And then I got the call from the woman saying, you've got to get him out of the house because if you cannot get him out of this house, my husband will kill him. And I'm not meaning euthanasia, I'm meaning something like taking the cat and flinging him against the wall until he's dead. Now, I've had, as in a course of being a behaviorist, I've had many calls from people who wanted me to take their problem pets off their hands. But this one I really felt was very, very serious and needed to correct action. So I arranged for Simon to be adopted to me formally. I took him to a veterinarian to make sure that he didn't have any medical problems that were causing these issues. And he was fine, except for having hypothyroidism, which is a form of thyroid dysfunction that's quite common in elderly cats. What was interesting that had happened was that from the moment Simon left his former home, he never once urinated outside the litter box. And that gave me cause for hope that I could put him in a good home. So the first lesson I got from Simon was, no matter how long you've had a bad habit, you can always shake it. It wasn't always easy to place a, a cat, particularly one who's elderly. I mean, he's 16 at this time. He has hypothyroidism. Um, my own cat had zero tolerance for newcomers, so that didn't seem to be a, a, an option. I put him in a luxurious boarding facility. Susan and I visited him. We watched him play floor hockey with a tinfoil ball, etc. But, you know, a month had passed and there was newcomers. So I decided I had to take him home with me. I had a special door built in my home, which is two stories. He would have the upper floor. The resident cat, Catherine Twinkletoes, would have the main floor. And we'd probably have to live a split existence for the rest of our lives. Okay, and that's what behaviorists would tell you, is that when you're trying to integrate two elderly cats who haven't got a history of getting along with others of their species, you know, just give it a rest, live and let live. Four days later, Catherine and Simon were living quite harmoniously on the same floor, which just taught me my second lesson from Simon, which was always prepare in advance for what to expect, but also be prepared for the unexpected. Okay. The only fly in the ointment was that he developed an intolerance for his medication, so he could no longer take the tapazol and needed radioactive iodine treatment. Uh, treatment at that time was not available where we lived. It was hundreds of miles away at a specialty hospital, and he was put on a waiting list. That's when his and my relationship started to form with Reiki. Any of you who know about hyperthyroidism know it increases the me metabolism. The heart rate starts to increase incredibly, so does respiration, so do all organ functions. Um, the cat will often eat voraciously and yet starve to death if untreated. So one of the things I did was I made a commitment to him that we would have a 30-minute Reiki session twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. It was all the Reiki I could afford the time to give him, but I felt that at least it would give him the opportunity to have a little metabolic rest. So I borrowed Susan's pediatric stethoscope. I would take his heart rate before the session, which would be well over 200. I mean, it would be so fast I couldn't even count it. And then we would begin the Reiki session. And the interesting thing was that for the first 10 minutes, time would drag. I mean, I would swear we'd been doing Frankie for an hour, and I'd be constantly and constantly looking at the clock. And then almost like clockwork, at, within the 10-minute mark, something would really shift, and it would shift really quickly. And the next, the rest of the session would just fly by, and at that mark, his heart rate would be normal. His respiration would be normal, and I could only assume that the rest of the body functions were normal. So at least he was getting a bit of a break. Uh, the time came, we ended up taking him. He was successfully treated for the radioactive iodine, um, etc. And then two months after his treatment, he had to be retested just to make sure that the uh, treatment was completely successful. Instead, what happened is it showed that his blood results uh, were far worse than they had been when he had gone in for treatment. I became hysterical and absolutely demanded that the lab rework all the blood. They did, and the results were terrible. And the veterinarian said that in cases like this, what happens is it's not hyperthyroidism, it's cancer. So she x-rayed him and she found a whole series of grape-like clusters in his lungs. 
So we were told to take him home and to just make him as comfortable as we possibly could. And I vowed after him having such a hellish life that I was going to do everything in my power to make him have the nicest summer he could possibly have, just lying on the deck and watching the birds and enjoying the sunlight. And so he became less tolerant of eating food. I had to make him special chicken in a crock pot. Uh, so that's why one of his names is Mr. Chicken. And uh, we let him stay on the deck. He soaked in the sunlight. And we just sent him lots and lots and lots of Reiki. And over the summer, he started to get a little better, a little less lethargic. His coat started to get a little better. He started to have a little more interest in life. By the end of the summer, you couldn't even tell he was ill. His coat was healthy. He was looking good. His appetite was normal. And so I took him back to the veterinarian to have his blood work redone. The thyroid levels were almost normal. They were like within seven points of normal, which was incredible. And the x-ray showed no grape-like clusters, whatever. They had gone. So we were all overjoyed and ready to celebrate and have a great party and stuff. And we had a wonderful time with Simon um, until the next, the next year. And in the next year, I started to think that something was going wrong. By this time, I'd been really confident. I mean, after all, you know, the cancer was away, the thyroid was fine, so um, I didn't even worry. And I must admit, I was quite lax in the Reiki sessions. And uh, I said something was wrong, took him to the veterinarian. The veterinarian said, no, all the tests are normal. And so at uh, being concerned that the possibility of being branded hysterical, I kind of laid off the vet until the fall when something became seriously wrong. And by that time, what had happened is he had developed lymphosarcoma. And so Simon was not with us uh, for very much longer, although he had taught me a number of lessons. And it's the lessons I want to share with you because I've really applied them to my life. And that's one thing I think that is, is very useful to know, is not only can Reiki be a gift that you can share with your pets, but it's also a wonderful method of self-discovery. The lessons that Simon has given me that have stood me in good stead have to do with me ridding myself of a bad habit, just like he had that bad habit of urine spraying and aggression. My bad habit has had to do with my romance with food. And about two years ago, I decided to say goodbye to an excess of over 100 pounds. And throughout my life, I've always battled with diets, with physical regimes, and they have not been successful. Instead, I used Simon's uh, modeling because I knew that if Simon could overthrow a bad habit literally overnight, then it should darn well be possible for me to overthrow one as well. And so I used that and the other lessons he told me, the lessons about being prepared for the expected and also for the unexpected, have got me through many an unexpected social invitation that hasn't revolved around food or dinner in a restaurant. I learned that my small commitments to his regular sessions showed me the importance of being diligent and making small, regular, continued commitments rather than extreme efforts to myself. And this, frankly, has been the way that I have managed my weight. Now, I'd love to say that my weight management issue is a thing of the past. Uh, I have been able to maintain this thanks to my diligence and thanks to Simon's lessons for the past two years. However, a lifetime of habit, the presence of stress, and my genetic inheritance can sometimes get the better of me. And it is even then when I think back to Simon's lessons in resilience and how he kept bouncing and bouncing back, because that has given me the inspiration to keep bouncing and bouncing back with the weight problems of my life. So I just want to reiterate that truly, our teachers do wear fur coats, and we have had many, many life lessons from pets. There might be a little time for some questions because we, you know, we do have a half hour between speakers. Does anybody have anything they want to ask these wonderful women? About your pets or anything? Oh, there's one back here, okay. Uh, 
I'm the interview lady. My name is Linda. How are you? Oh, we, enjoy, we enjoyed listening to you. Um, I have a 20 pound cat and she lays on her back with her tummy in the air and she's very happy and healthy and her fur is good and she eats well. But, um, yeah, um, is that normal? Is that nothing to be concerned with, do you think? You mean the fact that she's 20 pounds? No, that she's on her back with her tummy in the air. Her tummy's okay. exposed. I think she's happy. I don't think there's anything now, wrong. I mean, and that, is that a normal posture for her? Yeah, she does it a lot. It's a very trusting posture. Um, are you able to touch her tummy? Mm hmm Okay, she is showing you incredible trust and incredible love. Okay, that's what I thought. Perhaps usually when they're on their back, people think it's a, a, a submission pose. It isn't. It's a defensive aggression pose for most cats, and often if you attempt to contact their tummy, they'll start raking you with their claws, because that's how they would defend themselves. So if a cat is allowing you access to this most vulnerable portion of their body, it's an incredible, incredible gesture of love and trust. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? We got some, we can't come. Okay. We, I give her that one over there. Okay. I, I, I have a, um, I have a cat. First, thank you for all that you've been teaching us. Um, I have a cat that's called Russian Blue, and I live out in the country with five acres of open land, a lot of birds and all and so on, and it was abandoned when it was approximately four months old or something. I'm not quite sure, but, um, I don't believe in chemicals and I mean all kinds of injection shots and so on and so on because it seemed very healthy but I did have it inspected and it was cleansed when I got him but and it's a he I had a dog who was a she so I mix up this is a he <laughs> Mishu is the name I gave him anyway the thing is that uh, when he was about uh, two years old I had him neutered about two years old uh, he got so sick so terribly ill I took him to a veterinary hospital and they said he had a well first of all he is psychic and sensitive he taught me how to behave as a kitten because I talked to a communicator animal communicator who said that uh, the way he's behaving went crazy all over the place for a while and urinating in different places he, I knew he shouldn't he said he's trying to communicate with you so then I learned having lived alone for about 30 years that I was so egotistical at least at home that it was a disaster so I put myself in his place. And when he wanted to play or do something, I paid attention to him. And he calmed down. No messing, no problems, and so on. But he did get very sick when he was two. And so um, it turned out that I had been feeding him, if I dare mention it, food from Walmart. <laughs> I'd been just packages of different kinds of things. And I didn't know what, to, what else to do. I hadn't had a cat since I was a child. So finally, I got two books on how to feed and heal cats with natural foods, organic foods, and uh, I did have to give him medicine and all, but finally he got completely transformed. Now he's about five or six. He's very healthy, he's very psychic, and in fact he does run my life because I have a sliding glass door. He has a little door to go in and out. And um, also I taught him though, a few things. I taught him that he had to respect me if I respected him. He would always come and meow to go out before I put the cat door when I was eating. I was sitting at the table. I'd be eating dinner. I'd be eating lunch or something. And I'd sat down. I played with him. But he would come and he would crawl up on the, get on the chair and scratch at me and all to play. And I finally learned that he understood what I was thinking. It took me a while to realize this. So I said, I would say to him, no. I learned I didn't have to have a long explanation. He learns the word no meant no. I'd say no. I am eating. I'll let you out later, or I'll play with you later. Not now. Well, within about a day or two, he came to understand that. And sometimes he would circle over towards me when I was eating, and I would look at him, shake my head, no. And he'd go away until I finished eating. But now, this is years later, now at the sliding glass door, which I didn't used to have, uh, he doesn't want to go out through his cat door because he has to push his nose in under there, and he doesn't like it. And so he will meow at me to let him to, to go over and open the sliding glass door for him, which is big and heavy. 
and he will keep meowing at me. I could be in the kitchen, I can be somewhere else, I can be at the table, I can even be eating a meal. He's gotten spoiled again. And he will meow or even crawl up the back of my chair if I won't go and open that heavy sliding glass door to let him out. <laughs> but I love him and I know that we communicate and I sometimes heal him. I haven't studied except beginning Ricky, but I heal him with my hands. My intention sometimes is to pet him, smooth him. I'm intuitive, I think sensitive. I go down his head and all the way down his back and even up his tail. I give him a long, slow, and he lets me do it. He seems to like it and sometimes turns with his tummy up when he's grateful for something or other I've done. <laughs> so I just wanted to say I know that all this works, but the food is totally important. Thank okay. You. Okay, that's, uh, she had somebody in back of you there. Let's do her. We only got time for a few. Okay. My question is this. I have a friend with an English cocker, and the, the, the cocker has developed a hearing problem, although I'm not completely sure if it's really a healing, hearing problem or not. Is there a way with the Reiki to cure that? Um, I haven't, my own dog is an American Cocker Spaniel and she's going deaf. And, and all of the dogs that I've worked with and some of the cats have had hearing problems. I haven't known the Reiki to cure that, but what I have seen is that the Reiki sessions that I've done with the animals have calmed the people down to where um, there is an acceptance within the family of the hearing problem and, and the animals adapt really quickly to hearing loss, blindness. I lived with a blind, my cat Beakers um, lost his eyes at the age of six and he adapted and, and everything and lived for many years. But um, no, it won't cure the hearing problem, but it helps with the emotional adjust, adjustment and like I said, the animals don't have the issue with adjusting, it's the people. <laughs>